On Friday morning, the 15th of July 1938, George Brain drove the green Austin Big 7 Company van to his workmate Bill Frost's house in Twickenham, South London, and said he wasn't going into work that day. On the previous afternoon, his manager, a Mr Bosley, had told Frost to go with Brain to his house after work and collect some outstanding money, around £30, worth almost £2,500 in today's money, that Brain owed to the company, G. Hurt & Co., a West End-based industrial boot and shoe repairer, for which he was employed as a van driver. On the way home from work that Thursday evening, Brain told Frost he did not have that sort of money, but would try to get it that night and repay the company back on the following morning. Unable to raise such a large sum, Brain then decided that the only way was to abscond, and told his friend as much. Frost told him to hold his hands up and face the music, but Brain replied, for what I'll get it doesn't seem worth it. He then said he would try to get a boat to Spain. Frost drove the green van back to the garage at Whitfield Place off Tottenham Court Road and when he told the manager what Brain had said, he contacted the police. What began as a simple case of embezzlement soon took a dramatic twist when Divisional Detective Inspector John Henry went to investigate. Detectives in Wimbledon were already interested in the whereabouts of a green van following an incident near the common two days earlier and after speaking with Bill Frost and searching the van, a manhunt was set up for George Brain now wanted on a more serious charge of murder. Outwardly, George Brain and his 24-year-old fiancée, Sissy Gadd, were a perfectly happy and devoted couple, and when she found herself pregnant in the early spring of 1938, Brain agreed at once that they should be married, and a date was set for Thursday the 21st of July. 27-year-old George Brain lived with his parents in an end muse house at 18 St James's Cottages, Richmond, and had a steady job as a van driver, keeping the vehicle parked up at home at night. But behind this outwardly normal relationship, things weren't quite as they seemed. For one thing, Brain was fond of spending a lot of time at Wimbledon Greyhound Track, and was gambling more than his wages would cover, and had began dipping significantly into the money he had collected on his rounds from work. Also, despite his impending nuptials, Brain was also not averse to spending some of his wages on prostitutes, and with one in particular, he was becoming something of a regular client. 30-year-old Rose Muriel Atkins worked as a full-time prostitute, and plied her trade mainly in the Parklands area of Wimbledon, close to the common. She had a variety of aliases, but was known to her friends as Irish Rose. The mother of two young children, she had separated from her husband, George Atkins, a laundry worker from Lambeth, two years earlier and although she had only seen her husband twice since her separation, she managed to keep in regular touch with her children. On Wednesday evening, the 13th of July, Sissy Gadd went alone to the cinema at Kingston, and later that evening, after finishing work and dropping Bill Frost in Twickenham, George Brain drove over in the van, hoping to surprise his fiancée when the film ended. Failing to see her, he decided to go for a ride, and by 11.30pm was on Somerset Road, Wimbledon, in the shadow of the tennis courts. It was known locally as a lover's lane, and as Brain drove along Parkside, he spotted Rose and pulled up at the pavement. Dorothy Grant, a housemaid who lived close by, saw the woman climbing into a green van and watched as it pulled away down the road. Shortly after midnight, a motorist driving down Somerset Road spotted the body of a woman lying in the road close to the pavement. She appeared to be the victim of a hit and run, but on closer examination it was soon clear her injuries hadn't all been caused by being struck by a car. Home office pathologist Dr Eric Gardner carried out a post-mortem and found that the head injuries had been caused by a blunt instrument but added that she had been stabbed in the throat. The injuries sustained from the vehicle were soon found to match the tyre threads of both Austin and Morris vans and when Doris Grant gave a statement to the police and mentioned the green van, this became a vital piece of information. Divisional Detective Inspectors Arthur Philpott and John Henry handled the investigation with detectives sent to interview owners of all green vans in the area. When news of George Brain's embezzlement was reported and DDI Philpott examined the bloodstained van, it was soon clear the two incidents were linked and a manhunt set up. Brain was described in the newspapers rather unflatteringly as being a native of London, 5 foot 7 inches tall, heavily built and weighing 13 stone. He had a red fat face with deep set blue eyes, a double chin and a large nose. He was last seen on Saturday morning buying a newspaper in Richmond and was dressed in a tweed sports coat, grey flannel trousers and a dark blue pullover with a diamond pattern. Despite this detailed description, Brain was able to stay at liberty for a further nine days. Officers searched drain shafts and disused sewers 
close to the River Thames between Burns and Richmond, and tip-offs were passed to the police in all parts of the country, with many man-hours wasted chasing false leads. On July 25th, two police constables followed up a report that a stranger was living rough on the cliffs near Sheerness. A young boy spotted a man lying in some gorse bushes on a cliff ledge on the Isle of Sheppey and told his parents, who in turn notified the police. Two constables hurried to the scene and crawling through the gorse bushes spotted a dishevelled brain lying on a blanket reading a newspaper. Brain admitted immediately he was the wanted man and said he had been sheltering in a cave, adding that he hadn't eaten for over a week. Taken back to the station, he was given a roast beef dinner, which he quickly wolfed down and asked for seconds. Returned to London, Brain made a detailed statement to the detectives. I wish to tell the truth as to what happened. I met the girl several months ago and I had seen her about four times altogether. On that Wednesday night, I saw her and pulled up to the pavement. Hello, shall I come in, she said. Yes, I replied. The question of money was not mentioned. We went round the side of the tennis courts and stopped. She was sitting next to me and said, I am in financial difficulties and want some money. I told her you will not get much out of me and she said, I will report you to G Hart for having the works van out late at night if you don't give me some money. I said, don't be silly, but she said she had seen my driving license and knew my name. I slapped her across the face and she screamed and then bit my hand. I picked up the starting handle which was beside the seat and lashed out at her. I then went blank and I didn't know what I had done. When I came to, I found she was slumped in the passenger seat, not moving. I drove the car back onto the road and pushed the body onto the pavement. I then drove home and told Mummy and Dad I was late because I had had trouble with the van. Next morning I threw water into the van and tried to clean up the mess with some rags. I found the girl's handbag and when I opened it there was four shillings. I took that and hid the handbag behind some boards in the works Gary's washroom. Brain made his first appearance at the remand court at the end of July. Evidence was given of his arrest and he was further remanded for another week. Large crowds had flocked outside Wimbledon Police Court hoping to catch a glimpse of Brain, but he was delivered to a side door in a police van and returned to the prison the same way. At a second hearing a week later, again large crowds gathered as evidence was heard of the events that took place on that night. Prosecuting for the Crown, Mr Vincent Evans told the packed courtroom that the prosecution's case was based much on Brain's confession in his original police interview and statement. Home Office analyst Dr Roach Lynch said he had found bloodstains that matched the dead woman on the panels inside the van and these were produced in court. Also produced was a bloodstained starting handle and a knife containing blood and her that matched the victim and which had been used to stab Rose Atkins in the neck. Brain stood trial for willful murder at the Old Bailey before Mr Justice Rottersley on the 20th of September. The prosecution's case was handled by G.B. McClure and Christmas Humphreys and, as it is remanded, Brain was defended by Fred Hallis. Swearing in a jury, four had refused to serve on the case as they stated they did not believe in capital punishment. As at the remand hearings, the main evidence against Brain was from his own statements and the forensic evidence gathered from the works van. Brain had made no mention of using a knife in his original testimony, but McClure told the court that Rose Atkins had been murdered as a result of having her throat cut by a knife identical to the one found concealed on a girder at the West End Garage from where Brain worked. Defending, Mr Hallis tried to claim that the attack was due to Brain being severely provoked and that the case should be one of manslaughter. Countering this, McClure addressed the jury and said, if it is sought to reduce the crime to manslaughter on the grounds of provocation, you will have to consider whether the degree of provocation was sufficient to explain or to allow it to be possible for such force to be apparently used. The ferocity of the attack suggested that Brain had committed such a violent act that it had to be murder. Rose Atkins was known to have been with another client at 10.30 that night and he had paid her four shillings. The money had been taken from a handbag which supported the theory it was a violent murder with robbery. Brain had no previous criminal convictions, but his story of having no memory of the crime beyond the first blow did nothing to sway the jury, who took just 15 minutes to find Brain guilty as charged. Now heavily pregnant, Sissy Gad was refused permission to get married while he waited in the condemned cell. Brain's parents, well liked in the area, organised a petition for a reprieve and thousands signed. An appeal was launched but quickly rejected and his mother was horrified to find that the revised date of execution was to take place on her 58th birthday. There was to be no clemency and at 9 o'clock on a rainy Tuesday morning, the 1st of November 1938, 
George Brain was hanged at Wandsworth Prison by Tom Pierpoint and his assistant Stanley Cross. A recently trained assistant Herbert Morris was also present acting as an observer. Being stocky and heavily built, Pierpoint gave him a relatively short drop of just 5 feet 10 inches. Knowing his 22nd year as a hangman, it was Pierpoint's 204th execution. Sissy Gadd maintained her love for George Brain and a fortnight after the execution, she gave birth to a son, which she named after its father and she moved in with the Brain family in Richmond where the child was raised. The cave on the cliff at Sheerness, where fugitive George Brain hid for those nine days, became one of the most popular and unusual tourist destinations that summer. But with the passage of time, like George Brain, it soon became forgotten, and over the years the cliff gradually eroded away into the sea. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hangman's Record, and also check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find out more about my books and order copies of The Hangman's Record at a special subscriber price. Please also follow me on Facebook on my Hangman's Record page, where we can discuss this and other episodes in the series.